Okay, it's Armistice Day, guys. I had to do something for Armistice Day. Um, this is pre-prepared, so it's actually scripted, so um, sorry about that. Now, I'm not big on anniversaries in life, nor remembering things you were never present for, or attaching love to strangers who you don't actually know, but it's a centenary that is the 100 year anniversary today of the end of World War One. Now I've got some things I want you to check out, I'll mention them again at the end of this video, but um, first I guess I'll just show you, um, hopefully I can show you a quick clip of each, um, just as a teaser, so you can go and watch these things and you can learn a lot about World War I. Uh, the first thing you should check out is, uh, I think it's called The First World War, it's up on YouTube anyway, um, and I've got a playlist on my account that leads to it. It's a ten-part black and white documentary. Well, I think some parts are in colour, actually. All the, the old footage is in black and white. It's a ten-part documentary. I think each episode is around 40 minutes to an hour. And that's fantastic. That's probably the best resource I've got um, about World War One. Few Italians wanted to fight, but the Allies offered a chunk of Austria-Hungary, part of the Dalmatian coast, and threw in a few islands. So without consulting Parliament, Salandra accepted, landing his people with one of the harshest fronts in the entire war. It was brutal terrain. In front of them, the vast Lagatsoi mountain. By sunrise, the Italians had climbed its sheer rock face to a narrow ledge. They were now fighting a vertical war. Above them, the Austro-Hungarians had fewer men, but showed a tenacity they lacked elsewhere. Austrian Colonel Victor Schemfil watched his men attack the Italians below. They threw several hand grenades on the ridge, which was about 100 meters below them. Judging by the screams of the wounded, and from the fact that the machine gun hasn't fired a single shot all day, we must have been successful. Uh, the second best thing that you should watch is, or rather listen to, is Dan Carlin's podcast series, Hardcore History, Blueprint for Armageddon. There are six episodes of this, and you have to have a long attention span because they're four hours long. Each episode is four hours long, so you can watch a bit and come back to it. Uh, they are gripping though, he has this uh, awesome gravelly voice and he goes into details that probably weren't mentioned in that 10 part documentary that gives you an overview of the war. So everyone's got gas and everybody's wearing gas masks now and you end up with these images that are still to my mind the, the greatest images of the First World War because they say the most. When you'll see, for example, I love the one that shows a German cavalry lancer in 1916 or 1917 who's wearing the Stahlhelm, which will come into vogue in 1916, which is basically the same basic design you'll see the German army have in the Second World War. So he's wearing like a German Wehrmacht helmet with a lance on a horse and wearing a gas mask. He's like half medieval knight and half stormtrooper from Star Wars. And that to me encapsulates what this war is, these meetings of the modern world with the pre-modern world, like a historical estuary, like I said. Because it boggles the mind a little bit, doesn't it? That you don't get your first metal helmet really till late 1915, which means all these people have been fighting the most artillery intensive war in human history by far with cloth hats on their heads digging holes in the ground where the only thing that's exposed to fire 
is the top of your head, and it's covered by a hat. And forget the obvious thing about, like, shrapnel exploding in the air and just, you know, hitting you in the head. So many of these shells don't come all that close to you. They just blow tons of rocks and stuff up in the air that then come down and land on your head. How many casualties from the first year of the war could you attribute to the fact that none of these troops had metal helmets? It's crazy to think about, and crazy to think that it took them a year to come up with that. Third thing I should think you should um, have a look at is the Great War YouTube channel with Indy Nidell. Uh, that's a more, um, if, if you uh, don't want to get so much into the darkness of the world and don't want to get brought down because it's um, learning about the Great War is easily very depressing and very frightening and scary. Um, if you want a more jolly, upbeat take on all the events of the war, watch Indy on the Great War channel. The war-making power of Germany, even to defend its borders, was within a few days of collapse. But the war was still active in the field. On the 9th, the Americans advanced into Lorraine. On the 10th, the Canadians enter Mons, where four years ago, the British Expeditionary Force had first seen action. Germany would surrender 2,000 planes, 5,000 artillery pieces, and 30,000 machine guns. The Allies would occupy, and German troops would evacuate, Western Germany up to the left bank of the Rhine, and the Allies would take three bridges across it, Mainz, Koblenz, and Köln. Black Sea ports must be evacuated. They asked for the Germans to hand over 160 submarines, but this caused a technical issue as the Germans did not have 160 submarines. So they changed it to all submarines must be handed over, but the war is over. This has been, without question, the greatest, most challenging, and most fun thing I have ever done in my life, researching, writing, and presenting the whole world war. And then, of course, I play Battlefield 1. Uh, <laughs> you, can, you can see what that's like anyway by watching my channel. But that's a good World War 1 game, and I wish there were more. I think there's one called Verdun and Tannenberg that you can play, um, which is similar, like first-person shooter style. Um, but there needs to be more World War 1 games, and BF1 is the best i found, even if it is flawed. But yeah, the, the biggest thing you should check out is that World War, sorry, first World War documentary. That's awesome. Anyway, the First World War fascinates me. You could learn stuff about World War II by accident in this world. People won't stop talking about it and glamorizing it and basing their worldview on it. But World War I was before that by 20 years and was the first major modern war with guns and vehicles. The era of swords and muskets and horses started ending in this war, and the era of machine guns, tanks and planes and bombs was beginning during this war. Uh, the tank was actually invented in World War I, with a little help from H.G. Wells. The world was an entirely different place. The British Empire reached its maximum size in 1920, just after the war ended, and through the war was the largest the world had seen. The most spectacular thing about looking back on this war is what we've been celebrating over the past four years. In 2014, it was the 100 year anniversary of its start, and that is, all of the photos and video footage you're seeing is 100 years old. Now I find this the most fascinating. And later today, when you're seeing video clips of the war, I want you to remember this. Remember that most video you see today is young, and high def, and of a world you know and understand. But the World War I video is often black and white, hard contrast, low resolution, using cameras that were at the time very hard to use, film, no digital, and made by dead people featuring dead people, some who would die in a short time after the footage was filmed. These were their final days on Earth. Some of the soldiers smiling, some deeply depressed and horror-shocked by seeing their best friends physically end in front of their eyes, and people who've lived lives we could never truly empathise with, but only dream about. People who were never born with an internet, 
or a TV. Although, they would have gone to the cinema, read a pre-1914 classic novel or book, or seen a painting, or bought clothes. Some things were the same. Many other things we would expect them to know, but if you thought hard about it, you'd realise they wouldn't. And this war mesmerises you in its difference from World War II, which followed. There was no clear-cut evil or good on the opposing teams who fought. You have to look at maps of Europe and confuse yourself that the countries you know now and their shapes were different. The borders all was moving and changing and starting out differently. The place where the war is typically said to have begun, on a bridge in Serbia, is now Bosnia. Several countries we know today were joined together in giant clumps back then. Austria-Hungary, the Balkan countries, Czechoslovakia, and the Ottoman Empire. History fascinates me in how what we know of the world was completely different, depending on which year of the Earth's timeline of history you pick up to look at on a map, for instance. So a little bit about World War I then. In the year 1914, 104 years ago, the consensus say the war started when a rough nobody in Serbia named Gavrilo Princip, working for the Black Hand, a secret society formed by elements of the Serbian military breaking off from Serbia itself as a rebel faction, who wanted a unification of the South Slavic peoples in the Balkans into one country. Gavrilo Princip and five other men were sent out to Sarajevo by the Black Hand as assassins one day to kill Archduke Franz Ferdinand, who was going to be the heir to the throne of the Empire of Austria-Hungary, a huge country back then, which contained some of the South Slavic regions needed by the Black Hand to unify. After botching the original assassination plan and thinking it a failure, and after hurried changes in route of Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie's vehicle, Gavrilo Princip was placed accidentally in a place where he could fulfil the mission. He assassinated the royal couple with a pistol on the Latin bridge in Sarajevo. After this event, the Austro-Hungarian Empire sent the Kingdom of Serbia an ultimatum, which they partially rejected, and Austria-Hungary declared war. Because of peace treaties, allies and protectorates between many European countries, this war instantly roped in many countries to the causes of both of these countries, the beginning of the First World War, uh, more specifically the July Crisis. The July Crisis in the summer of 1914 saw many countries taking sides in the war. Austria saw the unity of the South Slavs as a threat to the unity of Austria itself, and wanted to show Serbia a powerful blow so that it would think twice about Yugoslav nationalism. But Austria feared the Russian Empire, who supported Serbia. And so it asked help from the powerful neighbour, the German Empire. The deal was that the Germans would defend the Austrians against a possible Russian attack. The Germans agreed, hoping the small war between Austria and Serbia would not draw Russia in if it was fast, if it was done quick. But instead of a quick attack, Austria took its time planning the war, and during this, Russia decided that it would intervene if there was an attack on Serbia. Allied to the Russians was France, and so surrounded on both sides, Germany would have to fight a war on two fronts, to its east with Russia and west with France. Germany would have to attack France through neutral Belgium, first and fast, before fully turning its attention to defeating Russia. The British Empire was allied with Russia and France, but still sort of friendly to Germany at the time, so they stayed out in the beginning, but Germany entering Belgium would be enough to bring Britain into the war. Uh, this war would rage on tearing up Europe for four long years involving the Turkish Ottoman Empire, Italy, and even Canada, America, Australia, China, and Japan, making it a conflict between countries of the world on two sides. 
So I'm not going to go on there for the history of World War I. Um, this war was enormous and complicated, but I hope you check out the media I've linked in this video. Watch a few episodes today, maybe. I'd recommend finding a simple overview video of the whole four years, or focus on the beginning of the war and how it all started. That should be a good way to begin learning about it. History is a tangled mess, but if you take a step back and simplify, you can understand the present day and the world a lot better than you do now. And there are some very interesting things that happened in the past. I enjoy exploring time. You should check out, once again, the First World War 10-part documentary. And I've got that in a playlist um, tied to my account on YouTube here. Uh, the Dan Carlin podcast series, Hardcore History, uh, specifically the series Blueprint for Armageddon. There are six episodes of this. Each one is around four hours long. Uh, one of them is four hours and thirty. Those are very good. I've also got them on a playlist on my YouTube channel here. Um, the Great War channel is on YouTube. Uh, that is a very big channel. They've been doing like day-to-day like a hundred years ago, but as if this is the news of today sort of thing. And place in Battlefield 1. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's Armistice Day. And uh, it's 10am now, or it's 10, 10 ish but at 11 o'clock, I think, around about then, on the 11th of the 11th month, November uh, 2018, this year, it will be a hundred years since the same date on 1918 when the armistice was agreed and the four long years of insane, crazy, needless war between many countries of the world finally ended. And I think it's very interesting to look into that war and what actually happened then, because some crazy shit happened. Happy Armistice Day! The Germans planned to hit the Russian Second Army in these woods, near the East Prussian town of Tannenberg, where, 500 years before, a Polish army had defeated a force of Teutons. The stakes were high, Germany fighting to defend her native soil. Julius Bolt's regiment was whisked from Western to Eastern Front. After a 60-hour train ride, a quick march for nearly four hours straight to the battlefield. I had my baptism of fire. Oddly enough, it left me completely cold. In a flash, I thought of home, gave one glance to heaven, and then straight into the line of fire. When the injured scream, your heart clams up. There's almost nothing left of this hospitable town. What's left of the buildings is either still burning or in ruins. Charred corpses lie in the streets. <laughs> 